I have to make this quick. I don't have much time. None of us do. I'm going to leave out some details and change others. I have no way of knowing which of you reading this is already working for them. In fact, you don't know if you are either. Christ, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start from the beginning. I'd known Brian since college. We lived on the same floor freshman year and had some intense Call of Duty battles while everybody else was out improving their social skills. He was an asshole, but he was my kind of asshole. And I took a liking to him. He was a computer science major and I was in the music school. To this day, I don't know a damn thing about computers, but I would get a kick out of listening to him talk about that stuff. He did a lot of black hat hacking and would constantly make vague references to bizarre documents and schematics he would pull off the government computers. To me, they sounded ridiculous. Bioengineering doomsday viruses, underwater experimentation labs, laser cannons in space. I was convinced he was making it all up to me. After graduation, we both stayed in the city, but weren't able to see each other much due to our risk effective work commitments. We'd get together every few months or so and he'd always have some new piece of government conspiracy meat for us to chew on. We got drinks over the summer and he told me he was looking into something major, something called Operation Stingray. Serious security, even around the most innocuous reference to it. A very, very big deal, he assured me. I nodded and challenged him to some drunken team fortress can't tonight man he said but when i blow the lid off this thing i'm going to pyro for your ass like the good old days sure thing brian i said let me know how that works for you that was the last i'd heard of him for months then one of the blue out of the blue one night he texted me need a talk maybe at local restaurant tomorrow at noon don't mention this to anyone. Sure, man, everything okay? I don't know, just please don't be late. I chuckled, always so dramatic. Lindsay rolled over in bed. What's up, hun? She said. Nothing, babe. Just Brian being a Brian again. Go back to sleep. I got to the restaurant a few minutes early and snagged a table for the lunch rush. Across the street, there is a small protest going on outside one of the big town banks. Money for schools, not for bonuses, they chanted. Brian staggered in. Weak old scuff, pale and puffy skin, bloodshot eyes, sweat. I think I've seen him like this a few times in college, but Christ. We're supposed to be adults by now. He clutched a crumpled manila fold envelope in both hands. Morning, beautiful, I said. Thanks for coming, man, I don't know what else to say, I'm sorry. Dude, relax, sit down. He glanced around the restaurant and took a seat. He didn't let go of the envelope. Were you followed, he said. Listen to you, were you followed? Are you serious? Look, can we pretend to be spies, but only so long as you don't actually creep me out? He reached into the envelope and pulled out a small white pill. He handed out to me. What the hell is that? I said. Just take it. Dude, I'm not going to get fucked up with you in a crowded restaurant in the middle of the day. It's not. It's it's a vitamin. Take it. Since when did you become a health nut? Just fucking take it, man. Please. His eyes were wild and desperate. And they evaporated any trace of a smile from my face. Okay, okay, chill. I took the pill and swallowed it. Happy? He visibly reacted relaxed and reached to the envelope again. He removed a stack of papers and placed them on the table. I'll try to go over what I can. I don't know how much time we'll have, but everything you need to know is right in here. Seriously, Brian, are you going to tell me what I just swallowed? I started over a year ago, he said. 
I was cracking some DOD contractors for shits and giggles and I kept seeing the word Stingray being mentioned in cryptic shit, like top secret memos that just said Stingray is a go, stuff like that. I was curious, so I poked around for leads. There wasn't a lot go to go on, but there were a few breadcrumbs that led to a facility out in the desert in Bumblefuck, Utah. DRS-117, they called it Tiny Place, a staff of a couple dozen with bullshit names like Jane Smith, John White, etc. Everything about the place is classified, and I mean everything. The fucking cafeteria budget was redacted. Riveting. You've really outdone yourself this time, man. Shut up and listen, he said. The place was a black hole. No info came out of there at all save for a few emails sent to DOD heads that said the project is proceeding on schedule. I poked around for a while and eventually I pulled a name from the applicant. They were interested in working with the DRS-117. Some big shot neurologist out of Stanford. A few days after I saw his name mentioned, there was a news report that said that he had died in a car accident in the Red Woods. A few days after that, a memo made the rounds that said the new 117 project member is moving to be a valuable resource to Sing Ray's development. A smiling waiter walked up to our table. Are you gentlemen ready to order? I think we'll need a few minutes, I said. Not a problem, take your time. The waiter lingered for a second. His, his mouth was smiling, but his eyes seemed to be studying us. He left, and Brian continued. The Stanford guy was a big name in this field. He specialized in developing systems that could link the human brain to com with computer inferences. His early work eventually led to the development of some new next-gen politics. He leaned in and his voice dropped to a low whisper. Here's the kicker. At the time of his death, he was working on a method for wirelessly transmitting electrical signals to the, into the brain to stimulate neural impulses, massively complex stuff, but the gist is that a system could project images, sounds, and sensations directly into the brain from a computer. Not just that, but depending on what part of the brain you're targeting, it could create emotions, memories, even though themselves, uh, even thoughts themselves of a thin air. His colleagues thought he'd lost his shit, and he maintained that system would someday revolutionize mental health treatment. He thought he'd be able to diagnose specific malfunctions in individuals' thinking and fix them with a laptop. Of course, after the accident, no one was able to locate any of his research. His hard drives had been erased, and his notes were missing from the lab. I rubbed my eyes. I wasn't nearly drunk enough to be listening to this shit, and I was starting to get a headache. Not to sound uninterested, I said. But let's go ahead and order already. I'm not feeling so hot right now. Try to focus, he said. I need I knew I needed to get more info, so I looked for a week for a weak link in the communication chain. I found the information choke point, and one guy who was direct lanes in between 117 and the defense department, everything went through him. Over a few months, I got into every piece of computerized electronics this guy touched and awaited. This guy was careful, very careful. It took a while, but eventually he slipped. He left an unencrypted video file on his laptop without password protection one night, and I snatched it up. While I watched it, I... Well, see for yourself. He tapped his phone and handed it to me. The screen showed a large white room with a chimpanzee sitting in the middle eating from a bowl of fruit. Off to the side, a man stood at a computer console. He was facing the camera. Stingray experimental test subject number 117-011. Simple mo motor functions, he said. He tapped on the keyboard where the chimp stopped eating. Stopping, stopped moving at all, actually. It sat there completely motionless like a doll. Right arm, and the, the man said, he tapped the command on the keyboard. The chimp raised his right arm. Stand, the man said. The chimp stood up. Take seven steps with you, to your left. The chimp did so. The video cut out and started up again, apparently on a later date. The same setup as before. Experimental test subject number 117-11, the man said. Emotional regulation. He tapped on the keyboard and said anger. The chimp immediately flung at the fruit across the room and launched into an awful screaming rage. 
It rushed at the man and raised its arms to strike him. Sadness, the man said. The chimp collapsed on the floor and moaned. It curled into a ball and pressed his face against its knees. Fear, the man said. The chimp screeched and scrambled to the corner of the room, wide-eyed and shaken. Again, the video cut out. When it restarted, the man stared at the camera without speaking for a long silence. Experimental test subject number 117-11, he said at last. Self-preservation override. The man tapped at his keyboard then paused for a moment. Looking at the chimp, his finger hovered over a key. Then he sighed and pressed it. The chimp went motionless for a second. Then he raised his hand to his face. The chimp sat there quietly as it tore out his own eyes. The man looked into the camera. Based on these results, I recommend moving into phase two immediately. The video went black. What the fuck did you just show me, I said. That's not even the half of it, Brian said. Pretty soon after I saw that video, I started talking with Lafargue, and that's when things got really got weird. The waiter stepped up to the table again. Brian waved him off. We'll still need a few minutes, he said. I'm sorry, officer, but there's a phone call for you. Brian frowned. It must be Lafarge. I told him I was meeting you right here. Brian and the waiter stepped into the back of the restaurant. I sat there, rubbing my temples. I wasn't in the mood to listen to conspiracy fantasies, and now it looks like I was getting a migraine. I decided that I was going to excuse myself when he got back. Conspiracy games aren't fun when you're having a splitting headache. I looked at the window at the protest. A wayful girl with blonde dreadhawks and a knit sweater was reciting slam poetry about the greed, evil of greed. The ineffectiveness of it all would be comical if it wasn't so sad. The waiter walked by again. I touched him on the arm. Listen, I'm afraid I'm not feeling well and I have to step out. Please tell my friend I'm sorry and I'll get in touch with him later in the week. Not a problem, sir. Will your friend be arriving soon? No, I mean my friend who was just sitting here, the one who took a phone call. The waiter looked puzzled. I'm sorry, sir. I'm not sure what you mean. What? Why? You've been sitting by yourself since you arrived. I looked at him. Was this kid messing with me? That's not funny, I said. I stood up and walked to the back of the restaurant. Brian? I said, hey, Brian, are you back here? I turned down to the small hallway that held the phone into the restrooms. It was empty. I checked the men's room, nothing. I walked back to the front of the restaurant. Okay, kid, cut it out. I said to the waiter, where's my friend? I'm sorry, sir. I don't know what you're referring to. I felt eyes on me and I looked around. The rest of the wait staff were all standing perfectly still, staring at me with blank expressions. The waiter stepped towards me, but... There's a phone call for you, he said. Please follow me to the back. The waitstaff advanced on me. A thunderous crash sounded as a brick smashed through the plate grass window in the front of the restaurant. I looked out the hole and saw that the peaceful little protest was turning savage. Protesters were smashing windows and cars and aggressed and attacking passerbys. A poetry girl was standing in the middle of the street, st staring into the restaurant with a crazed grin. We locked eyes for a moment before the police cruiser smashed into her sending her flying in a cloud of red mist. The restaurant erupted in chaos. Diners attempted to flee, knocking the waitstaff aside. I grabbed Brian's middle envelope from the table and jumped out the open window. Police officers flooded the scene. They fired tear gas and beat the protesters bloody with batons, but it was all wrong. They came too quickly, almost immediately as soon as the protesters had turned violent, as though as though they were waiting for it to happen. I sprinted home and bound up the stairs to my apartment. I flung the door open. Lindsay was slicing tomatoes in the kitchen. She gasped when I burst into the room. I slammed the door behind me and locked it. Jesus, honey, is everything all right? She said, I don't know. We have to call the cops. Something happened to Brian. What, what happened? He just disappeared. He went to get a phone call. Then the waiters... My head was throbbing and I collapsed onto the couch. Lindsay ran to me. Honey, calm down. Just breathe. Everything's going to be fine, okay? Just breathe. I sat up and she stood up behind the couch. Her hand on my back it made me feel better and I, I relaxed a little. You're right. I, I, just, I, I just need to think. I don't even know where to begin, I said. I looked down at the manila envelope in my hands and opened it and saw another smaller envelope inside. I pulled it out and saw that the words, if anything happens to me, were written on the front. 
Just calm down, Lindsay said, rubbing my shoulder gently. Whatever it is, we're going to figure it out. I touched her hand and looked up at the television screen. Thank you, I said, smiling. I looked back down the envelope, opened it up, and pulled out the stack of papers on top. There was one with a single word written in a black marker. Run. I looked up at Lindsay's reflection. She was raised a knife above her head, ready to plunge it into my back. I fell in love with Lindsay the first time I met her. It was her smile that did it, warm and sweet, with a sparkle of mischief behind the eyes. She was wearing that smile as she held the knife over me, ready to plunge it through the back of my neck. I leaped forward over the couch just as she whipped the knife down. It slashed my shoulder open and I fell onto the coffee table. I reached back to touch the wound and it felt hot blood seeping between my fingers. I rolled over and looked at her. Jesus fucking Christ, Lindsay, what are you doing? I stammered. She just stared straight ahead, not even looking at me, just gently smiling into nothing. Her head slowly lowered and she looked into my eyes. Everything's going to be alright, she said. She walked around the couch slowly and deliberately, her eyes fixed on mine the whole time. I rolled on off the coffee table and backed away from her in the carpet. Lindsay, I said, put the knife down. I'm not fucking with you right now. Put it down. Just relax, babe, she said. She walked around to the front of the couch. She picked up a stack of papers from Brian's envelope. You're going to be fine. Brian is going to be fine. Everybody's going to be taken care of. She stepped toward me, the papers in one hand and the knife in the other. I backed up into the exposed brick wall. The pain flashed across my shoulder. I stood up, breathing hard. Stop, I said. Stop right there. Please, don't take another step toward me, or I might have to hurt you. I don't know what's going on, but please don't make me do that. I love you, Lindsay. P please stop. She paused a few feet in front of me. We stood in a thick silence. You're such a sweetheart, she growled into a raspy voice that froze my intestines. Too bad it has to end like this. She rushed at me, waving the knife in front of her. I dodged to the side, grabbing her wrist, and spun her around to the wall. I, I pounded her wrist against the brick, trying to knock the knife loose. I felt a wet sap in the bone, and I gasped and looked at her. She was still smiling. I threw her to the side, and she groped on the floor. She laid there for a moment. Squares of bright sunlight from the window made her look like a dream. I was seeing purple spots in the center of my vision and a high-pitched ringing sound that spiked my brain like an ice pick. It was wrong. Everything was wrong. This couldn't be happening. I pressed my palms into my eyes. A pill. Something was in the pill that Brian gave me. And it was making me crazy. I have to wake up. Uh, that's all I have to do is wake up. I took my hands away and Lindsay was standing in front of me. The smile was gone. A guttural animal cry exploded from her and she swung the knife at my head. I ducked under her arm to shove her waist as hard as I could. She staggered back and fell in into the window. It shattered as she flipped over, clutching at the windowsill just as she went to, over the side. I ran to the window and I and I grabbed her whisk, wrist just as she let go of the sill. The knife spun and flashed down to the street. Brian's papers fluttered around like in the air like snowflakes. Lindsay looked up at me and the smile was gone. The rage was gone. It was just her. Oh my God, she cried. Oh my God, what's happening? Fuck, baby, ho hang on. I said my hands were sweaty and slick with blood. I squeezed harder and felt the bones twist and pop in her broken wrist. She screamed and jerked her arm. My grip slide down to her fingers. Hold still, I yelled. Hold still, reach for it with your other hand. I can't, I can't. Oh, God, don't let me fall. She was shaking, grasping for breath. I tried to pull her up, but my shoulder screamed fire and gave out. She slipped another inch. I was barely holding onto her fingertips. I looked at her eyes, wet, red, and frightened. I held her fingers sliding from mine. Please, she whispered. Then she slipped. I watched her eyes the whole way. Her scream cut deep into me and she hit the pavement with a crack that will ring in my ears forever. People on the sidewalk shouted and ran to her. They circled and one guy knelt down with their motors on his body. But he looked at the others. She's alive, he said. He, called, he yelled, call 911. I ran to the front door of the apartment, grabbed my coat over to cover her in case of shock and flew down to the stairs. I tripped and landed on the my bleeding shoulder the way down. I groaned and hissed through clenched teeth, but I scrambled to my feet, kept running. I got to the front door of the building and shoved it open. She was gone. 
I turned and looked both ways on the sidewalk. There was no Lindsay, no crowd circle, nothing. People were walking up and down the street like nothing had happened. I ran my hands to my hair. What the fuck? I whispered, what the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? I looked across the street. A man in a black overcoat and bowler hat was standing there. He watched each other for a very long, se- for a few long seconds. He held something in his hand. It was a dark blue and shaped like a smartphone, but thin and translucent like glass. He touched it, and I felt something like, a drill bit boring between the two halves of my brain. He's doing it. I thought something. Somehow he's doing all this. I felt an urge foam from inside me, an urge to run across the street and beat up the spun, sponge pulp. I could see his bloody face on the sidewalk in my mind, but a, a piece of paper rolling inside my leg snapped me out of it. I picked it up. It was Brian Snow from earlier. Run. I turned up the sidewalk, placed up a handful of papers strewn from the concrete, and I ran. A few blocks, I stepped into a drugstore and hid my bloody shoulder under a coat, and I purchased some first aid supplies. Is there a bathroom I can use? I asked the cashier. You're not going to shoot up in there, are you? She said. I walked into the bathroom and locked the door behind me. I patched my shoulder up the best I could, and I looked in the mirror. My headache was... A rock hammer in my skull and my eyes were starting to sting. I popped a few ibuprofen, but it, I doubt it would help. I pulled out the papers that I had rescued from the street. More MRI brain scans of certain areas circled the highlights. A satellite image that looked like a major city, though I couldn't tell which one. The sheet on the list of names on which I recognized a few political and media figures. It was a handwritten note from Brian that looked like the last page of a letter. Out of the city as quickly as possible. Don't pack. Don't talk to anyone. Just get to your car and head to nearby town. Like I said, I have to find Lafarge. You'll know what to do then. So I guess that's it. If you're reading this, we might not see each other again for a while. Maybe never, in fact. But just just know that you were always my best friend. Even if I never said it to you. There's no one else I can trust to expose these sons of bitches before it's too late. You're just going to succeed where I failed. I know it. Okay, enough of that. Wherever you do find Lafarge, Brian. Chalkboard fingers scratched my skull and my head felt like it was going to split in half. I flipped the note over. P.S. Sorry about the pill, man. It keeps them out of your head. But it has some nasty side effects. I looked in the mirror. An oily black liquid was trickling out the corner of my eye. Whatever you do, find Lafarge. Brian's last words echoed through my mind as I made my way uptown. I had a plastic bag with some supplies I had picked up on the way, bandages for my shoulder, a small pocket knife, a flashlight, some bags, trail mix, and a pile of water. Not much, but it would float me until I headed up to look for some Lafarge. Lafarge, Jesus Christ. I didn't even know who this guy was or how I was supposed to find him. Brian hadn't finished telling me the part of the story before. Yeah, before he, before they. I shook my head. My vision was shimmering like the pavement on a hot day. The side effects of the pill were getting worse, and I didn't know how long they would last. I was seeing things now. Several times on the walk uptown, I thought I saw a man in a bowler hat reflecting in the store window. He was never there when I turned my head, but I swear his reflection was getting closer. I reminded myself it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. At least I hope that's all it was in any case. As long as the pill was working, it was shielding me from their control devices. The real thing to be afraid of was the side effects wearing off. That's when I would really be in trouble. Control devices, mind control devices. It still sounded ridiculous. Even after everything I'd seen that day. There's the government's conspiracy that control our thoughts. Even everyone is in on it. For fuck's sake, there's, there are crackheads who think more rationally than that. What proof did I have? Brian's papers were gone. No one else could corroborate anything I'd seen. I was actively hallucinating at that very moment because of the pill. Oh my god, I pushed Lindsay out of the goddamn window. Or did I, I even do that? Was any of this real or was I lying in the hospital bed, foaming from the mouth, shouting, they're coming for my thoughts, don't let them get me? Was the world really in danger or was I just fucking lost? 
Whatever you do, find LaVarge. Okay, Brian, I said to myself, I'll, we'll do it your way. I'll head up north. If I don't find him, I'll get to enjoy insanity for the rest of my life. I've heard it's actually quite nice. If I do find him, well, I'll figure that out when I get to it. I found there my car was parked across the street in the dingy punk bar and a dozen blocks from my apartment. There was always park. There was always parking around here because old punkers would sometimes smack their cars with barred stools and relieve their glory days. My car was had a few new dings in it, but nothing major. I got in and set the bag down in the passenger seat. My phone chimed. I pulled it out of my pocket and saw my mom had texted me, What's going on? Call me. I looked around. The street was completely empty, save for the mailman making the rounds. I looked back at the phone. It was a stupid risk. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I, but I had to try to warn her. I swiped it open and called my mom. She answered. I could hear the fear in her words. Honey, what's wrong? The police just called me. They said something happened to Lindsay. Are you alright? I'm fine, Mom. I need you to listen to me. Grab a bag, pack what you need, and drive out to Aunt Clara's right and away. Don't stop. Don't wait for anything. Just get out of the house and go as quickly as you can. What on earth are you talking about? Are you in trouble? Tell me what's going on. I can't. I'm sorry. But I really can't right now. I'm mixed up in something big. And they might try to hurt you. I'll explain later, but... Just get to Clara's and tell Uncle Jim that he was my per he has my personal permission to shoot anyone who trespasses on his land. He'll love it, trust me. Who's trying to hurt you? Is Lindsay alright? I swallowed. Lindsay is fine, Mom. It's just Brian and I have been looking into something, and I really don't have the time to explain further. I knew it was something to do with Brian. That boy has done nothing but stunt your potential ever since you met him. He's a lazy creep, and he smells like stale potato chips. I don't know why you ever decided to spend time around, Mom. Will you just fucking listen to me? I shouted. I'm in danger, lots of it, and this means you're in danger, too. Get out of the house and get somewhere safe, now. Do you understand me? How dare you? I never thought I'd see the day where my own son would be shouting obscenities at me from outside a filthy bar like an animal. Oh my god, Mom, will you just stop and listen to- Wait. How did you know I was outside a bar? A silence on the other end. We only want what's best for you, dear. The driver's side window exploded as a mailman punched through it with clenched fists. I reached in and grabbed me. He reached and grabbed me by the jacket and pulled back hard. I shouted and punched his head, trying to knock him away. He barely flinched under my blows, and his hands were vice grips under my collar. I grabbed the steering wheel and pulled myself away from the window. I reached toward the passenger seat. The knife was just beyond my fingertips. With my other hand, I felt for his face and squeezed my thumb into his eye. His grip gave way just a bit and I grabbed the knife. Fierce adrenaline pumped into my veins and I flicked the knife open and stabbed frantically at his face. He held on, his eyes unflinched as cold like a wolf's. He pulled harder and I felt myself going through the window. A sick terror raced through me and I stuck the knife hard into his neck. I, he let go and clenched at his wound. I opened the car door into his gut and he fell backwards onto the street. I jammed in the keys, shifted into gear, and gunned down to the street. I looked into the rearview mirror of the man with the bowler hat stood next to a couple of mailmen. And he watched me drive away. Maybe it was my imagination, but I thought I saw him nod to me as I sped off. Late in the day, I reached the town Brian mentioned in his last letter. It was an old coastal town 200 miles outside the city. Quaint little place. I remember Lindsay and I had stayed at a bed and breakfast there once before the first day. I drifted the car in a wooded area a few miles outside of town and covered the rest of the distance on foot. I tossed my phone out the window after I got away from the mailman. All I had in my pockets were a few crumbled dollars and a flashlight. In the distance, I saw an old historic lighthouse. 
that was the old town's trademark. It stood watch on the rocky shore, still vigilant, even though it hadn't been used in years. The sleepy little town took shape as I moved closer to the shoreline and I walked down the silent main street in the afternoon light. During the tourist season, this street would be humming with families shopping for souvenirs and eating greasy, battered seafood. Now, though, the place was cold and deserted, and the sound of my own footsteps was making me nervous. Fine Lafarge. Well, gosh, Brian, couldn't you have given me a little bit more help with that? What am I supposed to do? Walk down to the town pub and ask if anyone knows him? I turned the corner and saw the one business now that was open. The Pink Corral Bar and Grill. I sighed. Fuck it. Walked. I opened the door and felt all the eyes in the room seize up at me immediately. Dainty little pretty boy from the city. Their eyes seemed to say, I remember why I hated this place. I took a seat in the bar and ordered a drink. My head was swimming and I rubbed my eyes with my thumb and forefinger. Then I looked up. I could see the man in the bowler hat reflection in the bar mirror in front of me. I gasped and turned around. Nothing. Whoa, relax there, buddy. We're not going to bite bartender said and a couple of the guys laughed i forced myself to laugh too and a sad attempt to look normal what brings you out this way sightseeing the bartender asked yeah just taking a drive up the coast to relax a little i said well you sure look like you'd use it big guy more laughter ha huh, yeah i guess hey listen there's an old friend of mine who used to live out here hadn't seen him in years name's lafarge do you know if he's still around the bartender cracked a wide grin. Yeah, this gentleman's looking for Lafarge, he called out. The bar flies cracked up and everybody turned to look at me. Yeah, the bartender said. I guess you could say that old nutcase is still here. Do you know where I can find him? Sure, the bartender smiled. Only one place to look. I stood in the graveyard in the smock and fading light, looking down the simple headstone in front of me. Sebastian Lafarge, February 19th. 1951, January 22nd, 2011. Together we will shine into the darkness. Okay, Brian, I whispered. I found him. You said I'd know what to do when I found him, so I did. So now what? I walked out of the graveyard, back towards the town. I had to have missed something. Maybe the Farge was just a code name or something, and I had to contact him a different way. Maybe there was another Lafarge in the town, and the bar hicks were just messing with me. Or maybe I was crazy. My head was starting to feel better. The pill was wearing off. Either I was crazy, or they'd t take over my brain soon. Either way, I was at a dead end. I kicked the plastic cup with the lighthouse logo down the sidewalk. Tears clad in my vision. Of all the places for the story to end, why did it have to end here? Why did I have to meet my doom in a bullshit little tourist trap town full of assholes peddling shitty food, cheap souvenirs, and stupid plastic cups with a cheesy lighthouse printed on the... Lighthouses. Together we will shine into the darkness. I run toward the old lighthouse as the pink sunlight faded into the sky. The wind whipped my coat along the rocky path to the, to the base. I flicked on my flashlight and found an old door rusted on the side of the lighthouse. It was locked, but a few good kicks out cook knocked it open. I climbed up the stairs to the lantern room and shined my flashlight around. It was pitch dark and dusty. In the crumbling remnants of the lantern sat the freight skeleton in the dark. I looked around. Aside from the ancient equipment, there was nothing out of the ordinary. Great. Looks like I just added destruction of property to the long list of crimes I'd be arrested for. I turned back towards the stairs. A pair of heavy hands clapped over my sh down my sh on my shoulder and threw me back to the ground. I cried out with the black form held me down and covered my mouth. I felt the cold metal of the knife raise against my throat. What are you doing here? Who sent you? The voice demanded. The hand moved from my mouth and I stammered. My, fr my friend Brian, he told me to come between gasps of air. The hand grabbed my face and moved it to side to side. The body stepped off of me and pulled me to my feet. Sorry about that, the voice said. I had to make sure it was you and not just them using your brain. Can't be too careful these days. Who are you? I said. He stepped into the moonlight. 
My name is Sebastian Lafarge. You and I have a lot to talk about, my friend. But the truth was, it's your free. So, Lafarge said, what's the plan? He was a big, hefty son of a bitch with a bushy mustache and a mop of stringy gray hair. Heavy dark bags sagged under his eyes and he reeked of B.O. and wood chips. I had no idea how he was able to ambush me without my smelling him first. I blinked. What do you mean? Brian told me to find you. I assume you had a plan. The father shook his head. Brian is the brains. I'm just the eye candy. So, where is he anyway? Is he on his way? My eyes sank down to the floor and I looked up. Lafarge's expression turned grim. Damn it, he said. I guess that means phase two is underway. Phase two? How much did Brian tell you? I told the story of everything that happened to me. Brian's disappearance, the riot outside the restaurant, Lindsay attacking me, the man in the bowler hat. Everything leading up to us meeting in the lighthouse. The fart shook his head. Well, you managed to make every stupid mistake you possibly could, but at least you're still alive. Maybe that's why Brian trusted you, because he knew you were lucky. Certainly it wasn't because he thought you were smart. I could see why he and Brian got along. Well, if we don't have a plan, then we should start. We should at least get out of this lighthouse, I said. Agreed. I've got a safe house a few hours from here. That we should do until we figured out our next move. But first, he reached to his pocket and took out a white pill and held that to me. I hesitated. Don't worry, he said. It's a much milder version than the old batches. Won't drive you crazy for one thing. I swallowed it. We headed back to, well, towards the town in the cold moonlight. The farge held a strange device in his hand. A mess of soldering electro, electro components. I glanced at it from time to time, looked around nervously as we walked in silent streets. It's okay, he said. I looked down at the device. The town's clean. Not a single stingray for a few miles in the direction. And they only get effective range from a few hundred feet. So we're in the clear now. Stingray, is that what they call the mind control device? Nothing gets by you, kid. How do you know so much about it? Lafarge let out a short, bitter laugh. Because, he said, I helped create it. I climbed to the cab of Lafarge's rusty pickup truck, and we drove off into the night. He stayed to the country roads. The branches made checkered shadows on his face as he spoke. 2008 scared everyone, he said. Until the U.S. government had been living in a world of make-believe, we had defeated communism and stood alone as the world's great, last great superpower. We were the capstone on top of a global pyramid, free to enforce our will as we saw fit. There was cracks in the armor, the towers, Iraq, Katrina, but the people in charge were, they were just a few bumps in the road, no reason to alarm just tweaks the strategy a little bit. But a black guy in the White House? That'll calm him down. But in the fall of 2008, the financial crisis hit. Global commerce stopped for a few days, stopped for a terrifying moment. The whole system looked like it could unravel. For every economist with a brain was saying the same thing. This is only the beginning. The boys in charge had finally seen the truth. They'd been having a picnic in the minefield, and the first one had gone off. In the 30s, it was easy. The great engine of American industry was still churning. There was enough resources to pull the whole world back from the brink. Not anyone. Anymore. Everywhere resources existed had contradicted in the hands of people who refused to give them up. Maybe a few more billboards would find would fund cancer research to win points with St. Peter, but by the large and financial elite had told Washington, we aren't paying for this mess, figure something else out. But it was a riddle without an answer. Who could establish a system? China? China is a house of cards, one real estate bubbled away from collapsing like the Soviet Union. India is the backwater pretender and Russians 
are digging for oil like a smack head, poking around for the last vein. No, there would be no real deal, new deal. And history shows that when a government can't govern, eventually the people will rise up. Democracy and commerce were no longer compatible. One of them had to go, so the plan was hatched. Funds were allocated. A tiny research station was built in the desert, all of it authorized by a top secret memorandum detailed by three phases in the desperate project Operation Stingray. I was brought in for phase one, testing and experimentation. I'm an engineer by trade, though. I had dabbled in biochem when I, in my youth. I detested the idea of working for the feds, but the money they offered was unbelievable. I flew out of Utah and walked through the doors of Defense Research Station 117, thinking I'd won the lottery. It was weird from the beginning. They gave us a few vague di directives, but never told us what we were actually working on. We weren't allowed to fraternize on anyone outside our immediate team, and we were under constant surveillance day by night. Eventually, a bunch of us confronted the principal investigator, a man known to us as Dr. Drazer. We told him it was ridiculous to expect us to accomplish anything that we didn't know what we were making, so he arranged a demonstration. He sat us in front of a table with a mouse cage on it. He wheeled in the bizarre contraption on the card and started typing on the keyboard. The mouse froze still. Drazer typed something else, and the mouse very slowly began to eat its own paws. I was shocked and sickened, and it looked like, and the look of Drazer's face, he was grinning. The frightening, inhuman look of a man drunk on power. We were horrified. Several of us demanded to be taken off the project, but Drazer told us all the same thing. You signed a contract. You belong to us. After that, they clamped down. We weren't allowed to call home, go outside, or even talk to each other about anything other than the project. They posted armed guards in every room. It was surreal and frightening, like something out of the Twilight Zone. Then one day they woke us up and told us we had completed our contra contractual obligations and we were free to go. We packed into the bag of the old army truck and drove away. I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised when the driver stopped the truck, orders us out, and told us to march into the desert. He sprayed gunfire into our backs, we and we collapsed forward in a bleeding heap. I was the lucky one. The shot went through my shoulder, missing every everything important. I laid there on the ground as a soldier approached us. He popped two into heads of every man down the line. I waited until he was at the guy next to me. Then I sprang up and wrestled the gun from him. I gave him two in the head and drove away in the truck. When I got back to civilization, I saw that the news was reporting deaths of every member of the project and their families, all killed in a tragic accident, car crashes, house fires, accidental drownings. I had apparently suffered a massive heart attack, but I was the only one whose family hadn't died with him. It was a message. Drazer was saying, don't even think of coming forward, or your wife and son will pay. So I stayed in the shadows, determined to find a way to shine a light on this whole thing. I've been on the run ever since. They brought a new team after us. Now it looks like they've moved in to phase two. What's phase two, I asked. What do you think? Field operatives, crowd control, targeting, assassination, using the ray to eliminate enemies and prevent a mass, the masses from congealing into any kind of a threat. It was a remarkably simple feat. That riot you witnessed, for example, they didn't need to take over everyone's brains to do that. It was probably a single ray turning up the aggression on a handful of protesters and setting the whole thing off. That's all they need. The ability to control a few key players at a few key moments enough to tip things in their favor 51% of the time with the proper planning 
you can control a whole city with a skeleton crew of maybe half a dozen rays. Put a crew like that in every major city, maybe infiltrate a few foreign governments and well, I'm sure Drazer thinks he can control the whole world like that. The scary thing is he might be right. Who's in charge of all? I asked. Lafarge shrugged. Ostensibly, it's under the Defense Department, but I don't know how much sway they really have. A couple of them got spooked and tried to pull the plug a few months ago. They promptly died by apparent suicide. Maybe the president is calling the shots. He's Maybe he's under the ray like everyone else. The closest thing to a leader the project had was Drazer, and he was more mad scientist than anything else. But you're already well acquainted with him, I believe. The man in the bowler hat? Bingo. He's a real ruthless sob. Thought of a man who loves power that much? Being given a blank check for it frightens me more than anything about this whole situation. I stared out the window. I had been too scared to ask the real question. I took a deep breath. So if it's a three-phase operation, what's phase three? Lafarge shook his head. Whatever it is, it's big. The largest wing in the facility has was behind a, a door marked Phase 3 Development. Drazer was the only one I ever saw go in or out of there. There was whispers and rumors, but no one had any idea what he was doing. All I know is that if Phase 2 is really being implemented, Phase 3 must be nearing completion. We pulled off the road into the long, gravel driveway leading to the tiny cabin deep in the woods. The far shifted into the shifted the car into park. Listen, he said. I know this is a lot to take in. I know it seems like you've be set yourself against overwhelming forces, but they aren't invincible. They are weaknesses. There are weaknesses. They've made the ray a handheld, but the trade-off is that it's a sig the signal is weak. They have to be near you for it to work, and that limits its effectiveness. And there's the pill. I had to dig up a lot of old biochem knowledge to create it, but it seems to work. If we can figure out a way to mass produce it and get it to the public, we can turn the tables. And most importantly, he said, they have the truth on our we have the truth on our side. That was the one thing they kept that kept Brian going. The fact that he was shining a light into the darkness. He and when he told me he was going to try to bring you to the Rendezvous, I knew that he must have seen something in you. Something that told him you would devote yourself to doing the right thing. He trusted you, so I trust you. He opened the door. So come in, he said. You have a lot of work to do. That was the few. That was a few weeks ago. Since then, we've been hard at work improving the formula for the pill and spreading the word. To whoever will listen. We've been on the move, staying in the various safe houses Lafarge has scattered across the country. There have been a couple of close calls, but we've managed to stay ahead of them. I'm sure most of you will think I'm crazy. But I'm speaking this to get the truth out there. There are still lots of unanswered questions, chief among them the nat nature of Phase 3, but I'll continue to update as we uncover more information. I'm sitting here now, Lafarge, waiting for Lafarge to get back from town with supplies. It's been a tremendous weight off my shoulders, and, I'll, and to tell you this to you guys, I feel less alone knowing that there are others out there who will share this burden of knowledge. Maybe some of you will help us resist, help us start the ripple that will become the, two, the tsunami, strong enough to defeat the whole operation. It's strange. I look out the window at the trees, and even though I know full well what we're up against, I feel strangely hopeful. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to turn things around, that will spark the movement too big for them to control, that we'll be able to wake the people up and tell them to- No, 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 no lights, lights outside the window. A helicopter voices soldiers, breaking glass, the bowler hat, they found me, God! <laughs> Dear Jesus, help me. They found me. 
The truck ground to a halt. Home sweet home, maggot. The gun butt jammed into my bruised ribs, and I fell out onto the pavement. Blood and mucus ran down my mouth, and I spat between clenched teeth. The inside of the hood smelled like rotten meat, like I was in my own little world of death. On your feet, gloved hands squeezed my broken collarbone and hoisted me to stand. I wheezed and hacked up something that tasted like rusty iron. I shuffled along the pavement. The shackles on my swollen ankles and wrists only give me a few inches of movement. There was a hole in the hood and I could see a few things, bright lights, guard towers, armed soldiers with dogs 50 feet in front of me, and the man in the bowler hat walked toward the large set of double doors. The doors opened as he stepped through them, and the guards inside saluted him. The gun butt struck me again, and I picked up the pace. As I walked through the double doors, I could read what was printed on them, DRS-117. I stood naked in the fluorescent room while the guards sprayed me down with freezing water. I turned the ho- they turned the ho- he turned the hose off and laughed at my shriveling form. Rat in the sewer, he said, and tossed me in a orange jump shoe. I was led into a cell the size of a closet and shoved inside. The heavy door slammed shut. And I looked around. The room was completely bare, save for a stone toilet in the corner of four surveillance domes in the ceiling. I sat down on the cold metal floor and put my head between my knees. No sitting, a voice said from somewhere, and a jolt of pain seized my body. Electrical currents ran through the floor, and I struggled back on my feet. I stood paced, stood again for what must have been several hours. I tried to lean against the wall, but the floor zapped me again. My feet were numb. I staggered and swayed and fought to keep my balance. Finally, my legs gave out and I collapsed on the ground. I braced myself for the pain. The door opened. He wants to see you. Two guards led me through the maze of brightly lit corridors. Men in lab coats and military uniforms hustled to and fro throughout the facility when he lay past me. Their eyes could dart downward, avoiding my gaze. He came. We came to a long hallway with a door at the very end. As we approached, I saw another man in orange stepped out, flanked by his own set of guards. My vision was blurry and distorted, but there was something familiar about him. I squinted in focus as he drew nearer. Brian. Oh my god, Brian, are you okay? I shouted as we passed each other, his head lifted, and I got a good look at him. His face was sunk in the hollow, covered in bruises and fresh scars. His lips were white and cracked. A part of his ear had have been torn off, but it was his eyes that frightened me, dark and empty, the soul eyes of a man being broken apart. He looked through me instead of at me and turned his head back down. The guards pushed me forward. We entered a tiny room, and I was strapped to a metal chair. The man in the bowler hat stood with his back to me, facing the wall. There was a long silence. The human animal, he said is a remarkable creature, not for its inventiveness, or his reason, or his ingenuity, or any of the other fabricated qualities for which he congr- congratulates himself. No, the human animal is remarkable for one reason, one reason only, his sheer capacity to delude himself, specifically his ability to pretend that he is not an animal. He imagines that he is above the natural world, separate from it. He creates a fiction of laws and morality to convince himself that he's being closer to the gods than the filthy earth. But man is not. He's made of air. He's made of meat. And he screams when that meat is torn from him. He cowers when threatened and groans when beaten. Man is an animal like any other. And there is only one law that governs animals. The right of the strong and ruler of the weak. He turned around, his pale, wrinkled face that would look frail if not for the crazed fire behind his eyes. You've caused a lot of trouble for us, young man, he said, coughing to a handkerchief. I don't like to have my time wasted, and you've wasted a lot of it. Where's Lafarge, I said. He smiled. 
Lafarge never stopped working for us, he just stopped drawing a paycheck. His task was to find weaknesses in the operation, and he performed it admirably. Even if he, did, he didn't realize it, he was helping us. Once we know how the pill functions, we'll be able to develop the next generation of Stingray, so that nothing can help keep us out of your heads. Of course, we will still have some research to do, but we will learn all that we need when we dissect his brain. I struggled to free myself from the chair, but the straps held me tight. You son of a bitch, I shouted. He stepped toward me and studied my face. Please, he said, call me Drazer. You and I are going to be working very closely in the coming days. The pill's effects are still protecting you, but that's just as well. I'm going to be doing this the old-fashioned way. He gestured to one of the guards and took a rubber club from him. He raised it above my head and smashed it down on my left hand. Bone splintering white paint shot up my arm. I clenched my jaw. I wasn't going to scream. He struck me across the mouth and te teeth clattered on the stone floor. He struck my knees and cracked reverted me up my thigh, but I gave him nothing. I panted hard. Is that all you got? I said. He smiled. Excellent. Truly excellent. I knew there was something special about you. He gestured to the guards. That's all for now. Take him away. The guards unstrapped me and lifted me up. I hobbled to the door. As we left the room, Razor called to the guards. Send his friend back in for another session. Electric pain jolted me awake. I had passed out, though. I wasn't sure how long. I scrambled back to my feet, and the guards entered me and carried me away. They laid me on the metal table and straps holding me secure. Drazer sat next to me, softly running a hand through my hair. He held a handkerchief to his mouth and coughed into it for a few seconds. Phase one was the most difficult, he said. The, scientists, the science was years behind when we needed it. And the most brilliant minds on the subject weren't exactly enthusiastic about the goals of the project. Nowadays, we can point the ray at them and make them do what we want, but back then we had to use more traditional methods. He dipped a small needle into the dish, clear water, and inserted it into my arm. Fire erupted into my veins, and my whole body burned with blinding agony. My hands dug at the table until my fingernails cracked. All in, after an eternity of screaming and anguish, the pain subsided. Phase two was relatively simple by comparison, Drazer said. Our first field agents were experts in human psychology, but we soon learned that that was unnecessary. As I said, humans are animals. When they're hungry, they'll eat. When they're scared, they'll run. When they're angry, they'll kill. If you know what buttons to press, you can make them do whatever you like. Stimulus, he said as held up another needle. Response. He inserted it into my arm, and I felt barbed wire in my veins again. My vision darkened around the edges, and the room started to float away. I thought I was dying, until cold water splashed in my face, bringing me back to reality. No, we didn't need experts, he said. We only needed men with the strength to pull the trigger. Of course, the project was still far from complete. There remains the possibility of a mass movement too large for us to control. The same problem that confounded leaders from Caesar onward still plagued us. How do you break the mobs will once and for all? We were determined to press onward until we had solved the final equation of history. My lips moved at the breathless air. Razor leaned in to press his ear to my mouth and struggled to make a sound. At last, I was able to force out a few choked words. What is phase three? Drazer laughed as he prepared another needle. My mind floated back from an unconscious void and I slowly regained my senses. I was strapped into a chair again, sitting under the pool of light in a dark room. As the fog lifted, I became dimly aware of the presence of another person in the room with me. I'm sorry, baby. My head shot up. Lindsay, I called. Lindsay, where are you? She hobbled forward in the circle of light. Her head was shaved bald, and a jagged scar ran over her scalp. Her arm was in a cast, and her left foot was twisted and bent. Jesus, Lindsay, I said, 
eyes wondering. Please believe me. I never wanted to hurt you. Tracer, that fucking monster. He's doing, he's doing all of it. Oh God, Lindsay. I I'm so happy you're alive. She moved closer. Her eyes were soft and sad. She gently touched my cheek. I'm so sorry, she said. It's okay, Lindsay. I'm sorry too. I don't. I know it wasn't really you. I know that Dracer was the one who... She shook her head. No, baby, I'm sorry. I don't love you anymore. What? Dracer stepped in from the shadows. There's nothing you could, uh... That we did... We cannot take from you, he said. Do you understand? Everything you own, everything you love, even the things inside your own head are ours to take and leave as we choose. He ran a finger down the nape of her neck. She closed her eye and moaned softly. I will take things from you for as long as you fight me, he said. I will strip you down to nothing if I have to. I will cart you down till I find your soul and I will smash it to bits and then when you are completely hollow I will f I have a final task for you his spotted hand ran up her arms and she sighed I shook my head Lindsay listen to me you have to fight it it's not you right now he's inside your mind he's making you do these things you don't want to do Jason smiled as at me as he unzipped her dress she certainly looks like she wants to, doesn't she? He made me watch. I stood in the cell. He was trying to break me, I thought. He doesn't want information, even if I had any to give. No, no, no. He, he wants to conquer my mind. He wants to do it without the ray. He wants to reduce me to a stimpering puddle. And when I'm kissing his feet and pleading for mercy, only then will he kill me. Well, I'm not going to let that happen. He can torture me in, to the brink of death. and With my ass, doubts, and strength, I will spit in his fucking face. If he kills me, he'll do it knowing that I defied him in the end. And if I can do that, others can too. We're the same, you and I, Dracer said, pushing me down the corridors with a, wheel with a wheelchair. I scoffed. I'm nothing like you. Really? Mind control isn't new. Organizations all over the world have been practicing it for centuries, albeit in primitive forms, psychological warfare, brainwashing, propaganda, and you, my boy, are a born prop propagandist. Or do you think we had seen this? He handed me the tablet with the web browser open. I looked at the top of the page. Operation Stingray is in effect. God help us. It was really quite amusing, he said. You published your story for the public to read, believing that you were striking a grand blow for freedom. You thought you could gra galvanize your readers to action and spark a mass movement to overthrow us. You believed you could change the world. He turned the corner and wheeled me down a long hallway. At the, at the end was a giant steel door flanked by two armed guards. Printed on the door was a huge bowl of letters where the words Phase 3 Development. It's time for you to see something, he Dracer said. The doors opened and he, we entered a massive dome-shaped room that was raised dials and centers. The days had a symmetrical of keywords control panels around it. I looked around and saw that the inner surface of the dome was covered in hundreds and hundreds of dark monitor screens. Dracer stepped into the dials and tra tapped a key. Upon the monitors leveled up. It showed a young woman looking into the screen applying makeup. A female voice was speaking softly. She spoke a rapid broken sentence fragments. She was talking about her classes, her mother, her laundry, her television show, all simultaneously. The image was odd. It was clear in the center, but fuzzy on the edges. It flickered dark every few seconds. Suddenly, it panned downward to show the bathroom sink, the hand picking up a tube of lipstick, and the image flickered back up where the woman began to apply lipstick. I realized she was looking to the bathroom mirror. Was she wearing a camera somehow? It was almost as though she was looking, it was looking through her. 
I gasped as I realized what I was saying. Dracer grinned. The first generation of stingrays were quite limited, he said. They allowed us to transmit commands with little else. But the newest versions are, wor are wonders and technological innovation. Now, not only can we transmit whatever we like, but we can observe and manipulate all brain activity as well. He typed a command to the keyboard. The woman looked in the mirror and her expression hardened. Her inner voice came grim and anguished. She said she hated herself. Her life was painful and meaningless. She would always be alone. The woman's face twisted. And a film of moisture distorted the image. She looked at the razor blade. She picked it up slowly with trembling fingers and held it to her wrist. Imagine, Razor said, as the monitor faded to white. Stingray antennas covering every ridge of the globe. Imagine countless minds at our disposal, ready and willing to perform whatever task we choose. Imagine wielding complete omniscience and impotence over all of humanity from this very platform. What is phase three, my dear boy? Three, phase three is nothing less than the power of God. He touched the key and the entire dome of monitors lit up. I looked through the eyes of people all over the world, a man shopping in a crowded market, a doctor performing an operation, a woman bicycling down a desert trail, a fighter pilot in the skies, an infant lying in his crib. You believe that you can lead the people in a revolution against us, Razor said. Tell me, what will you do when we have six billion cameras showing us everything we need to see? When every living creature serves us and their thoughts become tools we use to enforce our will. What will you do when we delete the world for resistance from human memory with a keystroke? I stood in a white room. The world was thick and distorted like I was underwater. Was I dreaming? Brian sat on the floor near the opposite wall, his head down, and his hands clutched the back of his neck. I called to him, but the sounds were lost, and the curled, curdled air. I ran to him, my slow motion body, heavy and aching. I called again. I needed to warn, warn him about phase three and the danger facing the world. I finally reached him and he looked up. His eyes were completely black and his face was a grimace of fear and pain. He shrieked like a frightened animal and he bounded away on all fours. He cowered in the corner of the room and screamed. Tracer's voice whispered in my ear, Animals, he said. I walked to Brian and begged him to snap out of it. I searched his eyes for any trace of understanding or intelligence, any trace of my best friend. But his eyes held nothing but a primeal fear, an unthinking look of a beast in danger. The look in his eyes was like a claw hammer to my heart. He had been broken. He was gone. You are alone, Tracer said. I sank on the floor. Yes, I was alone. Totally, helplessly alone. Tracer was right. He had taken everything from me. Everyone I cared about. Every hope I had. Everything. No, not everything. No, 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 no. I had one thing left. I had the rage that burned my chest when I thought of his face. I had the image of his bloodied corpse that hung in my mind's eye like a mandala. I had my hate. I would find a way somehow to get my revenge on him. And if I couldn't, then I would kill him every time I closed my eyes. And that was the one thing he couldn't take from me. And the one thing that would be mine forever. We've reached the end of our time together, Drazer said. We sat across from each other, separate from the small table. My body was weak and quivering, but I forced myself to hold his gaze. I, he coughed and hacked into his handkerchief, and when he pulled away from his mouth, I could see the reddish goo inside it. I cannot break you, he said. I have tried everything at my disposal, but you still defy me. The others have broken your lover, your friend, even the Farge begged for his life in the end, but no matter what I do to you, it only hardens your resolve. I can see in your eyes that your fury cannot be extinguished. It sustains you. It keeps you whole. He leaned forward. But anger is a lie, my boy. 
It makes you feel strong in moments when you are most weak. No, it's time for you to learn something about the true nature of power. He pulled a gun from his hip and placed it on the table. I laughed in spite of my aching ribs. That's it? You're going to kill me? Be my fucking guest. But do it knowing that you couldn't beat me, you bastard. Drazer grinned and shook his head. You misunderstand me, son. This isn't an execution. This is a job interview. He stood up and walked over to me. He unfastened the straps of my arms and he sat back down. A human animal is weak, he said. The weak of body, weak of mind, and all above weak of will. He tells himself fairy tales about the indomitable strength of the human spirit because in his heart he's ashamed of his weaknesses. He knows that he will crumble in place if under the slightest bit of pressure. He lifted my shaking hands from the straps and rubbed my wrists. But you, my boy, you are different. I saw potential in you from the very beginning. A fighter spirit, a fierce survival instinct, an iron that, will, that can withstand any attempt to destroy it. I placed my hands on the table. Just the kind of qualities I've been looking for in my replacement. I looked at the gun. I'm old. This line of work takes its toll over time. But I don't have it in me to see phase three in completion. We are on the cusp of a new day in history and we need a leader and the strength to pull species forward triumphantly in the glory that awaits. I touched the gun with a trembling hand. The parasites in this facility are worthless. Yes men and bureaucrats, spineless worms who couldn't wield true power without a memoriam telling them what to do. Now we need a god king, a, a pharaoh, someone with a vision and that will reign over the churning masses like Poseidon over the seas. I felt the gunmetal warm out to my touch. Someone who knows how to kill without mercy. I closed my hands around the grip. All great men have a virtue they cling to above all others. For some it is honor, for some it is love, for you it is vengeance. You will be a god of the Old Testament, raining punishment upon the wicked and cleansing fire. Your hate will light the way. I lifted the gun. It feels good, doesn't it, the power? Imagine willing this kind of power over millions, billions. This is your destiny, my boy. This is what awaits you. I touched the barrel of the gun to his forehead. Yes, that's it. I remember now. I remember the first real taste of power I held over another human being. I cocked the hammer back. I have the exact look that you have now. My hand is calm and still. That very same look. It's amazing what a shower or shave of a filet mignon can do for your outlook on life. I looked up from the phase three controlled dais at the dark world of monitors. I reached my bandaged hand to the controls. The doctors had patched me up and injected me with something to take care of the pain in my broken body. I had them thrown in the prisons afterward, along with half of the facility. Anyone who such as looked at me while I was in custody would be getting an important lesson about loyalty. Technicians were working on Brian and Lindsay, trying to reconstruct their minds from the mush that Drazer had reduced them to. They were making progress, though it would be a while before they were fully mental co capacity capable. They asked me if I wanted them back as they were, if I wanted to make any improvements. Mostly as they were, I said. Maybe make Brian a little less caustic and give Lindsay more of a sense of humor. And they both should probably lose any negative associations they might have with the project. Now that things have changed. I touched the control panel and the monitors lit up. Tracer was wrong. I would prove that. Phase 3 
is an incredible tool, a tool that could be used in the betterment of all humanity. I could end war, poverty, and suffering for all time. I would lead us into a paradise, a perfect world free from want or fear or death or any thoughts that could cause pain. Drazer wanted to use it for evil, but I would change the world for the better. No, he was wrong. I'm nothing like him, nothing. I looked up at the monitors, the world of minds ready and waiting to receive my input. I looked around me, and I smiled. 